thank you. Um, this is part of a larger project, and I, yeah, we can talk about the larger project if you want later, but if you're wondering why we're diving into the deep end of the pool, it's because there's a 200-page running start that I won't give you. Um, so here's the problem. Um, it's widely held that our, um, our epistemic objective is to believe as many truths as possible and disbelieve as many falsehoods as possible. And this is something you find, I mean, a vast number of epistemologists say this. So you've got Lehrer saying it, you've got Goldman saying it, you've got Alston saying it, you've got a bunch of younger people. All of them take it for granted as unproblematic. And moreover, it's supposed to be with respect to each individual proposition you want to decide on its truth value. And I think that this is, um, it's, the position is called veritism. And as uh, Selim Berger has argued, it's a form of epistemic consequentialism. Um, the end is getting as many truths, uh, or the highest proportion of truths over falsehoods as possible. Um, and basically everything else in epistemology is supposed to um, be instrumental to that end. And I think that's problematic for a number of reasons. Um, one is not every truth is worth having. Uh, I mean, they're just some trivial truths, and you know, wasting one calorie of energy on getting that truth is just not worth the trouble. Um, another is not all falsehoods are worth shunning. Um, I mean, this is something that, that isn't part of the big project, but if you think about the way that things like models and idealizations work in science, the fact that they're strictly false is not by itself an argument against them. So saying, well, it's false, you know, it's epistemically slipshod or maybe you know, heuristic value or something like that, that's problematic. Um, then there's a fact that not every epistemic desideratum can be cashed out in terms of veritism anyway. So for example, um, you say that um, science favors simplicity, but there's no reason to think that a simple theory is more likely to be true than a complicated theory. It favors precision. But actually, it's much easier to make a vague statement that's true than a precise one. So if you want to say that um, favoring these sorts of values is worthwhile, um, we've got to do something to our epistemology. So what I advocate is, uh, I'm not the only one who advocates this, but I am among the advocates of uh, what you could call epistemic um, responsibilism, where what makes a um, judgment, a, com a commitment um, epistemically acceptable is that it's um, produced or sustained in an epistemically responsible way, or by epistemically responsible agents functioning as <laughs> such. Um, so this has um, a number of problems, many of which you've no doubt already thought of. Um, one, of course, is the question of ought implies can. If you're going to be an epistemic a, a, a responsibilist with respect to something, I said, you ought to believe this. Well, if there's no such thing as a will to believe, that's really kind of a tacky thing for me to say. Uh, you know, I can't help but believe what I believe. And I think the way out of this is um, actually um, to not talk about beliefs, but talk about things that on reflection you endorse. And it might be, you know, you can't help but believe that snakes are dangerous, but on reflection, you realize that that kind of s snake isn't dangerous, so I can't re in endorse the thing that I can't help but believe in. That's, that's one pro thing we can get out of this. One of the things responsibilism does for us is get us off the hook with respect to skeptical worries. So imagine um, we live in a Barclayan world. I'm not gonna worry about malevolent demons. We'll let the demon be benevolent. So instead of material objects, what we have is robust ideas in the mind of God. A lot of our beliefs are false, and we can't tell that they're false because um, you know, God's the kind of standard God who can make these things so that we're <coughs> never going to find our mistakes. Um, still, what do we say about uh, two characters we might worry about. One is the scrupulous evidence-gathering scientist, and the other is the cavalier corner-cutting jumper to conclusions. They're both wrong, 
Should we say that there's nothing more epistemically admirable about the scrupulous scientist? Or should we say no? You know, he's never going to get it right because God's pretty sneaky that way. But he's making the best possible use of his epistemic resources, and that's exactly what he should do. And by the way, that's exactly what we should do. Um, so you get you kind of get to do an end run again around skeptical uh, questions if you take a responsibilist view. However, um, it puts us on the hook for things that the um, reliabilist might um, have an easier time with. For example, um, a responsibility for our methods, standards, and their products. Uh, if reflective endorsement is going to be playing such a central role, then the question, do you still endorse it? Now you've got this new evidence. Where do you stand with that? So, so you're going to get, um, I, I guess I want to say you're going to get less than people who read Descartes hoped they would get out of epistemology because you're never going to get something uh, that you can be confident is permanently credible since things can always be open to revision. Um, and I think that that's just true. So it, I'm not too worried about that. that you know, it, as more evidence comes in, it may be that you really do have to revise your views. And we just should get used to that rather than saying, no, I'm going to find the standard where I can be dogmatic henceforth and ignore any further evidence. Um, however, uh, if I say that, then, then we have the following question. Um, I say, let's not go with truth conduciveness or truth as our uh, desiderata. Um, question would be, well, if we can't use the truth of the conclusions and the truth conducers of the methods as um, our um, criteria for assessment, what can we use? And what is the criterion of uh, acceptability? And here I think it really is worthwhile to turn to Kant, and in fact, to turn to Kant's ethics. So I want to look at the third version of the categorical imperative, um, which is that a maxim is acceptable if it would be accepted uh, by a legislating member of a realm of ends. <coughs> and um, my view is that we can export this to the epistemic realm and say an epistemic commitment is acceptable if it would be acceptable to a legislating member of a realm of epistemic ends. Um, so, so basically saying, just as is the case in the Kantian picture for the ethical view, that the um, ethical agents make the laws that bind them and are bound by them because they think it's reasonable that they would be bound by these ethical norms. I'm saying, let's try the same thing with epistemology and say um, the uh, epistemic agents do the same thing. So we're going to get, I mean, I, since I'm stealing from Kant, it's obvious um, what we're going to get out of this, but I'll say it anyway. Um, there are autonomous agents capable of assessing their epistemic positions and of holding themselves responsible to the commitments that they can, on reflection, endorse. So uh, part of the question is, um, what does that involve? Um, as in Kant, the members of the realm of ends make the laws that bind them. They formulate the standards, set the constraints, and devise the procedures whose, pro whose products they can on reflection endorse. Um, they consider themselves bound to a network of commitments pertaining to methods, rules of inference, standards of acceptability, and the like because they think that by being so bound, they'll promote their epistemic ends given their epistemic means. Um, I actually think this is just um, what you might call an idealization of what a scientific community does. When you ask, what are the standards of evidence? What are the criteria of acceptability? What justifies these and why? Um, you, you can see that um, this, this is something that's, that's rather familiar. And it may be that, um, you get different answers to this question depending on the science you're talking about or the level of sophistication of the science you're talking about at a given point in history. Um, so there are a couple of things that we need to pay attention to 
in thinking about this uh, because I think they're I think they're very important to Kant too, but they're very very important um, if you're going to do the epistemic analog. First of all, <clears throat> Kant says legislating member of a realm of ends. He doesn't say philosopher king. Why? Because this is something that has to be social. Legislators have to work together. And part of what goes into, um, I, I mean, if we actually had a legislature that worked, um, uh, what, what would go into it would be the ability to convince the other legislators of the viability of what you're proposing. So you've got to have publicly available and articulable reasons that you have reason to believe the other legislators would have reason to accept. And you're wrong about your own position if, in fact, they don't have reason to accept. I've got to idealize the legislators, too, so don't panic yet. Um, but, um, but the idea would be that the, the fact that this is going to be a collective judgment is very important. The other thing is that it's a realm of epistemic ends, or a realm of ends in Kant, which means that you can't just do this piecemeal one by one and say, can you buy this maxim, can you buy that maxim, can you buy the other maxim, and say, sure, why not? Because they've got a mesh. So there are going to be very strong consistency and coherence requirements on what, what's going to turn out to be acceptable. And um, this means um, that as you devise and kind of re reform your various methods and uh, objectives, standards, and so forth, you have to be operating holistically. Um, then what about the legislators? Um, this is something I, it's probably implicit in Kant, but I, I, I'm actually now going to switch and steal a bit more from, um, let's say, Mill and Dewey, and say that in a political sense, they have to be free and equal. Um, I, I'm not saying they're equally intelligent, uh, you know, so it's, it's not the case that, you know, every, every member of the community is, is, is equally bright or anything, or even equally knowledgeable. But they have to be free to propose any ideas that they think have a bearing on the case. They have to be equal in that they're equally entitled to be heard. And the other members of the community have to give them an equal hearing. Uh, if you have a community like that, then the idea would be that the community's vetting of the hypotheses is a good reason for crediting them. If you have um, imbalances <coughs> in the community in one way or another, this is not going to be so. And this is some of the things that um, uh, uh, Miranda Fricker talks about with regard to testimonial injustice. Um, if certain voices are silenced or uh, their credibility is deflated, or conversely, if their credibility is given too much weight, then the um, acceptability you know, or, or the acceptance by a given community is not going to constitute a good reason to think this is an okay thing to think. Um, and um, then, because the fact that everybody who spoke agreed would be little reason to accept something if you think that some people were not able to speak, or they, were, they spoke but nobody listened. You know, you don't listen to those people. Um, you know, there she goes again. Um, uh, and this, I mean, I want to point out, by the way, I mean, Liz Fricker does this with um, literary examples, but I want to give you a real life example because it's very important that this kind of silencing or credibility deflation actually occurs in real life. And the example is Barbara McClintock, who in the 1940s discovered that um, uh, genetic information transposed along the chromosome of corn. So something that was at one place at one point, another place at another point, um, she wasn't believed. And she says, after she'd published a few papers on this and was completely poo-pooed, she completely stopped even trying to talk about it because nobody would believe her. 
And there's, um, I mean, there's an interesting debate in the history of science about whether the reason she wasn't believed was because of sexism or because of a prejudice against research done on corn. So there's an anti-corn <laughs> prejudice, too. I'm not kidding. This is real life. So, you know, I mean, we know it was prejudice, but which prejudice it was is, is still uh, 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 unclear. However, the interesting point, aside from the it's, uh, s uh, silliness of it, um, is um, that it wasn't until 1960 when uh, Pierre Jacob and Jacques Mounod discovered uh, the same transposition in bacteria that genetics recognized that this was something real. So we have at least a 15-year time lag, which is a cost to the epistemic community, aside from you know, doing injustice to Barbara McClintock. It's an injustice, a, a, a loss to the epistemic community if by not listening to certain people, you don't find certain things out. So the idealization of uh, free and equal, meaning equally able to speak and equally um, worthy of being listened to. This is a very important feature of what the community has to be like if we're going to say that um, having a certain type of community structure is going to give us something that's epistemically creditable. Um, now, what I want to say is that um, it's important to see this is, when I say this, and I, I, you know, I'm saying I'm sort of modeling this on some kind of idealization of a scientific community or a community of inquiry generally, it's not just a sociology of knowledge thing. It's not just this is what people do. Uh, because, I'm, I mean, you're talking about Barbara McClintock and all, they don't do it all the time. Sometimes it's, you know, there, there are very bad pressures against listening to certain ideas or against letting certain approaches be entertained. But if we want to say that, um, want, want a sort of procedural conception of what makes something epistemically worthy, you've got to say, from what we do, we can then do a kind of reflective equilibrium uh, account of how we can correct, extend, and amend what we do to come up with something that, as far as we can tell right now, is what ought to be done. Um, and the as far as we can tell right now bit is a very important thing because I'm not claiming anything, I mean, you know, I mean, the method itself might be something that works for a while, but I'm, I'm only, for, for specific acceptances, it's only um, now and for the foreseeable future that we can make such a claim. Um, but it's not sociology of knowledge. Um, and I'm also not claiming that the mere fact that some community or other accepts something is a reason to accept it. Um, I mean, this is an example that people always raise against me, so I will um, answer it now. Um, it's one thing if you say, as I would want to say, OK, here are some cases where you might want to see what the community thinks. You look at the scientific community. Maybe you look at you know, the, the community of auto mechanics. Well, they t can tell you something or other about that ominous rattle in your car or whatever. But what about the community of psychics? Um, it's a community. They maybe have, for all I know, they have community standards. Um, but you want to say there's no reason to credit their um, results. And I think that this is right. There isn't. Um, and part of the question is why. Uh, first of all, there are some constraints that I'm going to say are required of any community, namely consistency and internal coherence. So minimally, you shouldn't contradict yourself. Um, Moreover, you want mutually supportive um, commitments so that they're reasonable in light of one another and not just reasonable separately. Um, responsiveness to one's community of free and equal inquirers regarding what counts as a reason. So just you know, because I think so is not going to do it. Um, then we can ask about the specific communities and what they're trying to do. So let's look at the community of psychics, um, which I know very little about. But um, among other things, they make predictions. And here's a requirement on acceptable predictions. First of all, acceptable predictions should be um, determinate enough 
that they can be tested. Um, they should predict something that would not have been expected had the, um, uh, say, causal mechanisms that they're adducing not been held. And they should be borne out when tested at least often enough so that it's not a fluke if you got the right answer. This is something that uh, psychic predictions can't do. Um, the, um, I mean, look at Harry Potter. There's a scene where, um, I don't know, the, what's her name? Professor Trelawney, the one who um, teaches divination, um, reads Harry Potter's tea leaves and says, you have a mortal enemy. And Hermione says, everybody knows that. You know, that Harry Potter has a mortal enemy that we knew since the first page. <laughs> so, um, you know, so you don't get any credit for getting that prediction right. You have to predict something that we would not have otherwise anticipated and find that that had come out right. Um, if it's a predictive enterprise. If it's not a pre predictive enterprise, then you're going to have to use other norms. So if you're, for example, um, doing a mathematical thing, you have to satisfy the standards of proof. And those standards may be, I mean, you know, they're not empirical, they're not predictive, but there is such a thing that you can't, um, you know, there's a, that um, old cartoon where the guy's got all the equations on the board and then there's a space and says, and then a miracle happens, and then therefore P. And you kind of say, you know, that doesn't count as a proof. Um, so, so you'd want to, um, you know, say what are the standards here and what uh, would ac be acceptable. Um, but notice that um, these are very generic standards. The, I haven't said um, anything that's particularly specific, and I think that's probably a very good thing because um, it seems to me quite reasonable that different communities of inquiry would have different st local standards. Um, and um, they would depend on uh, things like the interest, the goals, the available <coughs> evidence, and so forth. So for example, um, if you're doing um, the cosmology of the um, genesis of the universe, there are very few accepted facts. If you can get those eight facts to align, you've probably got a quite good theory. Think of the moment people can get about six of them to align. But if you were doing something more up to date, getting eight facts to align wouldn't get you very far. Why? Because we know more than eight facts about you know, the uh, role of the cotton gin in the Civil War or whatever. So, so you're going to have to key these things to available resources. Uh, these can be you know, resources in terms of data. They can be resources in terms of methods. Um, and I think that's just um, a quite reasonable thing. Um, so this raises um, a couple of questions. One is, um, since we're here, where does epistemic humility come into this? Or where does intellectual humility come into this? And um, I want to say it's not an add-on. It's woven into the whole structure of the enterprise. Um, first of all, if we say um, free and equal inquirers, then I just can't go lording it over you because of my um, esteemed status or something. Um, the, then there's the fact that the whole thing has to be fallible and sensitive to changes that need to be made with the growth of inquiry. These can be uh, refinements of methods, refinements of standards. Um, they, they can even, although this is, um, let's say, um, you know, something we, we do at least mildly um, reluctantly, um, a kind of um, a change of standard. So, for example, um, all right, at least since Kant, um, that now I'm going to Kant's metaphysics, the idea that um, scientific knowledge um, should be causal knowledge did seem extraordinarily reasonable until it turns out that it's very hard to square with. Um, quantum mechanics that allows for things that are irreducibly probabilistic. You can explain that it is such and such probable that this decay will occur, and that's where it stops. Reluctantly, after various, you know, there are no hidden variable theorems are proven and so forth, you just have to live with it. 
And you have to say, if we're going to make any further progress in this science, we're going to have to relax the every, and by God, we can find it standard. Um, so we can, I mean, we, 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 if we look at what actually happens, and we look at what makes it reasonable, I think we have a way of making sense of how we could have a responsibilist picture of epistemic agency. Uh, but it's got to be fallible. Results are always provisional. They're always open to revision, either based on new information or just new ideas. Um, everything is subject to peer review, which is another element of um, humility. If, you, if everything is subject to peer review, then you're beholden to the community in a way that encourages, let's say, the institutionalization of um, uh, humility. It's not that you, I mean, you personally can be arrogant if you want, but your results will be acceptable only if, there's, if, the, if the community um, accepts them. This, uh, granted, it's an idealized community, but, um, and, and that means that we don't have to worry about individual personality traits if we've woven it properly into the institutions. Um, standards and results are all publicly accessible. And the idea is then that intellectual humility is not just, and maybe even not mainly, a virtue of individual agents, but is woven into the fabric of the community and what they collectively have decided is a, an acceptable way of living their uh, collective cognitive life. Um, notice a couple of things here. One is, first of all, I don't think this is just a concession to human frailty. You know, we can't get Cartesian certainty, so what are we willing to settle for? Um, you know, what, what's your second best? Um, and um, I, I mean, I think, you know, we can say that, and I think it is true that we can't get Cartesian certainty, so we have to ask for what's the epistemology of the second best. But it's also the case that if we do this um, picture of continual reflective endorsement and, you know, am I still willing to accept this? And then we get a richer, more textured picture of our understanding of our subject matter. And that in itself is valuable. If I think something is settled, I don't have to look back on it. And I don't have to ask, if it's wrong, where might it be wrong? Where is it most vulnerable? What am I assuming that might or might not be worth assuming? I should, I've got the answer. Uh, and um, so, so, so in a way, you're losing information by, um, you know, uh, by, um, by being dogmatic, even if it turns out you're right. So I think that the idea would be that you, you can um, get more information out of your epistemic situation if you take this fallibilist, responsibilist stance and recognize that possibility of error is always lurking around somewhere. Um, and notice, by the way, and this is the part that, I mean, where I get back to the other stuff I'm working on, what this enables is um, it opens the door to a, a non-factivism about epistemology. If I say that <coughs> what's acceptable is what the community deems acceptable under these idealizing circumstances. And I say, well, what's that? You know, oh, scientific models, thought experiments, idealizations. These folks use these things and aren't embarrassed about it. So saying it's got to be true or it's got to be truth conducive is not going to follow if it turns out that, the, say, the scientific community thinks it's perfectly OK to use things like the ideal gas law or um, Snell's law or something like that and you know, say, we, we understand things in terms of these representations that we know are not completely accurate. And um, I think that's, that's a very important thing that we, you know, that first of all, I think it is true that, that we, or at least the scientists, do understand things in terms of these things. And secondly, that rather than insisting on a truth-centric epistemology that has people saying, um, and, 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 and I mean, you know, I could you know, give you names. Jonathan Kvantig is one. Um, uh, Tom Nagel is another who say, in the long run, they'll get over doing this stuff and just go around asserting truths. 
Um, I don't see any evidence of that. Um, so, you know, just empirically. But, but I also think that the idea that it may be reasonable to understand things in terms of models and idealizations is something that epistemology should take seriously. And this picture enables me to do it. So thank you. Yeah, uh, Kate, thanks. A lot in there. Um, I want to focus on one thing. I wasn't sure what claims exactly you wanted to make for. I thought it was important that inquiries conducted by a community of free and equal people uh -huh. and were not and all broadly political. Um, yeah. Uh, and um, you know, we don't credit the results unless these conditions obtain. And I wasn't sure, I mean, so just try to get clear of what you're saying. Um, naively, um, lots of the societies that we think of as the paradigms of bad on, the, on those dimensions, so Nazi Germany, yeah. Communist uh, Soviet Union, were actually quite good at figuring things out that they were concerned to figure out, right? So German military technology, when we're racing Hitler for the atomic bomb, it would have been, it would have been foolish to think, uh, well, probably they won't be very good at this because um, the nature of the society and people are being excluded because the times tends to be there. So just, just a naive Okay, um, I mean, actually, okay. Um, okay, okay. So there are two elements to this, one of which is um, I don't want to make the claim, um, a, a strong claim, not unless. I'm saying this isn't an ideal, but, but leaving that point aside because that was just a kind of running start to your question, and that was in, in maybe the first clause. Um, Here's what happened, uh, I think it probably happened in Nazi Germany. I know it happened in the Soviet Union. In respect of their doing science, um, the scientists, I mean, okay, first of all, I mean, two, two elements to this. Probably, okay, stop, one thing at a time. Okay, in respect of, of doing their science, they were free. They were not free with respect to, you know, agitating against Stalin or whatever, but when Sakharov was inventing the atom bomb, he was doing the same sort of stuff that the Americans were doing in terms of being open to, um, you know, uh, looking at the evidence, assessing the evidence, uh, that sort of thing. So, so, so the freedom, I mean, it was localized in the, in the lab, let's say, or in the, um, the scientific domain. And in fact, that's actually where Sakharov got in trouble because um, he then said, hey, if we can do it there, how about emigrating to Israel, where upon they sent him to the gulag. Um, so you know, thinking that you could extrapolate from what you could do in the lab got him into trouble. But the idea that the freedom in the lab was there. Now, this is the second part, um, which is, um, Okay, I cannot say the following. Here's what I want to say, and I can't quite say it, but I'll say, I'll say it and then moderate it. Um, they were at a disadvantage because of the people who were silenced. So the people who could not be heard, say all the women scientists, um, that probably slowed down their progress because there were other perspectives that might have been helpful that they couldn't have. Now, the might have is, is where I have to make my move because I can't say I know that this slowed them down. For all I know, it didn't. But, but in fact, to the extent that you say certain perspectives are a priori blocked, you make yourself vulnerable. And so if you say we're going to silence this community, uh, then you're taking a risk since there may be something that members of that community had to offer um, that you didn't get. And that's the, I mean, that's the Barbara McClintock argument. But, but I think, I mean, first of all, you're quite right to say, look, I haven't got any guarantee that this always happens. But I do think it's plausible that it's an increased vulnerability, that the more perspectives you have that you can get to align, the less likely it is that your success is going to be due to a fluke and that you act you know, you're misunderstanding things. So I think that's right. Um, but as I said, uh, the idea here is, I mean, it, it's, it's exactly the same as the thing we, I think we have all the time in epistemology and all the time we have in ethics, which is that there is an element of idealization. This is not supposed to just be sociology. Um, and my idealization is not the same as the idealization of the, say, reliable, true belief folks who have to do a kind of little riff on what they mean by reliability to um, 
you know, limit the um, problematic cases or whatever. But I think that, I mean, I think that's a standard uh, methodological point that I actually think is legitimate. Um, The idea of a, um, a Kantian realm of epistemic animus. I was trying to think about what's a more pure example of that than Soviet scientists. And I think it's Wikipedia. <coughs> so, I mean, people, Wikipedia editors are all aiming at some sort of systematization of human knowledge. None of them has the power to send each other the gulag. So they, they, <laughs> there's relative independence and relative equality. And, and they have, they've done something like what you described, the idea of a, a collective of collective equilibrium, where they've worked out standards yeah. for how you edit and Good. how you, yeah. you've got little acronyms. But over time, problems have emerged where there are systematic differences in who, I think 10% of the Wikipedia editors are women. Um, lots of different figures who are not white men get marginalized within the Wikipedia editors themselves, et cetera. Um, that there are people who are really, really good at wielding the rules of Wikipedia so that they get to make what edits other people can't even though they aren't actually good edits. Anyway, all this stuff is built up. So one answer you might give here is that, that you're trying to describe ideals. Yes. But yeah. So now I wonder if you're vulnerable to an analog, analog to a, a very uh, current criticism of ideal theory in, the, in um, political philosophy and moral philosophy, the idea that Rawlsian ideal theory just loses touch with the reality of the world and it misses the fact that there's so much discrimination and so much inequality and trouble to begin with that ideal theory just, we're never going to get there. So, so, so I'm being distracted by the ideal theory and not paying attention to the harms that have fallen real actual people. Is this sort of idealization of a Kantian epistemology, you're going to have the same problem, that it's actually losing touch with the fact that really we're never going to get to the ideal, so we need, not, uh, we need to start from non-ideal epistemic theory. Um, okay, uh, first, I mean, uh, I'd actually like to defend Rawls, but I won't here. Um, but um, I think, I mean, part of the answer here, I think, is, I think Wikipedia is a great example, but it supports me, because what you see is over time, the norms have been improved. We're not there yet. But it used to be that anybody could go in and say anything, and hey, it's free. Um, and yeah, I mean, and, I mean, I know. I mean, it used to be that there was this, um, let's say, idiosyncratic um, interpreter of purse who every day would go in and put his changes in, and every night the purse scholars would go in and take them out. <laughs> and I mean, this is not a good use of anybody's time. Um, but it, but as this, as I mean, basically what they've done is they've bootstrapped their standards, and they're not there yet. We can't have only ten percent of the um, people contributing being um, women. We can't have only two percent of the uh, contributors being uh, non-white. Um, and and we know that. So so what we're doing is we're, is we're we're continuing to try to improve this. There's no claim that it's got to come out to an ideal in the end. I think this is a very important point. All we need is a notion of better than. So, so to say you're never going to get there, that I don't think is an objection. Now, the second part of your question, though, about am I distracting us from the real world, um, I don't think so. Um, I mean, maybe partly because I don't know exactly sure how close to the real world epistemology has to be. Um, but uh, I know, I mean, I think it's, it's a really deeply normative theory. And so if, and I think this is, I mean, something you might also say about Rawls. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure I will say this specifically about Rawls, but you could say something like, you wanted to know what justice is. I've told you that. I haven't said anything about how to deal with the fact that lots of things are unjust. That's a different question. And similarly, if I wanted to say, um, I mean, I, I think I said an answer in political philosophy. That's a terrible thing to say, but I mean, but but I mean, but but it's it's an available move, and I could say something similar with respect to epistemology. You want to know what is um, good in the way of belief or something? I've told you that. Is there a lot of sloppy thinking out there? Yes. What should we do about it? My answer, since I teach it in ed school, is we should improve our education. Okay. Uh, because a lot of people think rather badly about things. And there are some things we know how to do things about, and some things like the um, you know, very um, difficult um, heuristics and biases stuff. We don't actually know what to do about, but we know still that it's bad reasoning. So I think, I mean, I think that's the kind of answer I would give, but I think Wikipedia is exactly um, a, a much better um, example than anything I've come up with for why I think that this is, is actually a good way of thinking about things. Thanks for your talk. Um, I just had a question about the notion of an epistemic community and the possibility of uh, multiple epistemic 
yes. Yes. Uh, and how that relates to idealization, because I mean, at some points, you know, we speak of like the epistemic community, mm -hmm. you also seem yep. open to this kind of pluralism. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the psychic problem and stuff like that, and you wanted to rule out psychics by saying there's something like general standards that everyone has to meet, but then once you surpass those, there's maybe more. Yeah. Yep. So I guess my question is, um, given the, this pluralism about uh, communities with different kinds of inquiry with different standards, um, how do you feel about the fact that? Um, it seems like people are members of multiple communities at the same time with different standards. And how do we make sense of that? Because that might make it a bit more messy. Oh, it is a mess. Um, I mean, I mean, I don't know if I can make it more messy, but um, <laughs> I'll leave that aside. Um, no, I mean, okay. First of all, um, I do want the pluralism because I don't assume that there is a uniquely best way to do this. Um, so I think there are some general standards, um, coherence and consistency, at least. Um, and then there are others that are maybe less general, but still in the ballpark, like responsiveness to evidence if you're doing something empirical. Now, if the psychics say we're not doing something empirical, then the question is, well, what else are you doing? And maybe you're doing a great job of that. Um, so you know, it's, it's only on the assumption, as I was saying, that they're making empirical predictions that I can make my move. But um, what do we do about the fact that people are members of a variety of communities. Um, I don't actually know what we ought to do about this, but I think it's a problem on anybody's <coughs> view. So, um, you know, although I, I certainly agree I ought to have something to say about it. Uh, think about the following. Um, somebody who is um, a religious scientist um, even if you're not a, a you know, a fundamentalist scientist, um, you've probably got tensions in your views about causality. And somehow or other, you have to go in for some kind of compartmentalization. Now, the, I don't know that this is the best thing that a human being can do, but it may be perfectly reasonable, um, given our fallibility, to say, there. I have some reason to think that when it comes to certain types of questions, this is a good way of thinking. Some reason for thinking that's a good way of thinking. I don't know how to bring them into alignment. That may be at the moment the best you can do, and it's not embarrassingly bad. So I don't, I don't think that's a problem. I mean, I, mean, I, I, I think it is a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a human problem, but I think that saying that since we're always um, you know, tr trying to improve our views, and I'm not looking back from the point of view where I've got everything right. I'm saying, how can we move from where we are now to something that may be a bit better? It might be that um, what we have to do is simply um, try to just address these things piecemeal when they come into tension with each other. And the problem with, oh, I mean, but the reason why I think I may not be any worse off than anybody else is because that statement, when you make it, although, um, you know, if you're a veritist, it's true, it's also vacuous. You should believe what's true. Goody, what's that? I have reasons in favor of the Sunday view and reasons in favor of the Tuesday view, and I don't know which one it is. So to say that I ought to believe whichever one of them is going to get me to the truth if either, by the way, remember it might be that um, neither one is doing it. Um, it. It doesn't really tell me what to think. But that's a pragmatic issue, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, my theory is pragmatic. No, actually, my, okay, it's not conceptual. But no, I think. I mean, I think. I mean, I. I think. I can't divide the epistemic from the pragmatic. I think that's entirely right, and I don't think that. I mean, I, I, it seems to me that that's what we should be doing. Not not assuming that somehow or other you can say this is merely a question of pragmatics. Um, when actually that's part of 
what the question of what we ought to think, how we ought to proceed, has always got a pragmatic element in it. So I think, I mean, I think you're right about, you know, it is pragmatic. Please uh, join me in thanking our speaker.